This is the lecture for European history for Thursday, the 3rd of February, 2022. Everyone has their note pack out. We had been talking about the historical eras of communism and the millenarianism of that, past, present, and future, the ages of feudalism and of capitalism, is the world as it is and as it has been, the world that is unreasonable, ungood, un uh, unrighteous, and worthy of being destroyed. And the future millennium of communism or true socialism, which is a utopia, and what's standing between us and utopia is the proverbial day of judgment, day of the Lord, day of Hock, which is the revolution. After the revolution, after the means of production are seized by the workers, there will be a dictatorship of the proletariat, where the proletariat, uh, which are <clears throat> the industrial working class, uh, will rule with a firm hand until the people who recall the old world before are, well, die off, either with help or without. And only when the world is fully, <clears throat> fully occupied by people who were raised from birth to know nothing other than communism, communism, and communism, will the utopia be achieved and the iron grip on power of the dictatorship of the proletariat be released. All of this requires iron party discipline military discipline. Now, the Soviet Secret Service, the KGB, was famous for honey trap spy rings, uh, spy uh, operations. The honey trap is a colloquial term within the espionage community for getting a beautiful woman to pay attention to some dorky guy who is well connected and pump him for information and use him uh, ruthlessly. Now, in the Soviet Union, were there huge numbers of women that wanted to use their bodies as a weapon in order to further the communist cause? Well, not naturally, no. But the party's needs need to be served. Who are you to maintain your private morality, your individual discomfort, is not an issue. The revolution demands and the party demands of young men that they go fight in battle and die. We believe in equality. So you, beautiful young Soviet woman, are smart enough, are capable enough, you know the language as we taught it to you, to do this thing and do it well. And any problems that you have are your own business. Do not waste my time with your little problems. That is iron discipline. That is communism under the Soviet Union. And the same thing happens in North Korea today and in China today. The honey trap is alive and well because the party's demands are the only way that the millennium will be achieved, that the revolution will succeed. When communists join, they have dues that they have to pay to the party every month. To be a party member in good standing, you have to pay your dues. It doesn't matter whether you're a rich fellow traveling socialist or whether you have barely enough to eat. It doesn't matter. You pay the party. Now, in churches, this is called tithing. Tithing is a tenth of your gross income that you're supposed to give to your church. This is Jewish and Christian tradition from way back. Almost nobody does it these days, but that's expected. Because whatever your personal situation, you can pay a tenth of your gross income to serve the one truth, which is God. 
In the case of your Communist Party membership, it is the same attitude. Whatever your circumstances, but instead of it being a proportion of your income, it's a flat rate. You pay that amount. You find a way. You find a way to pay your party dues because the party's needs come first. In Confucianism, in traditional pre-communist China, the needs of the leadership outweigh the needs of the various members of the family or of the society. In America, we assume that parents routinely are supposed to sacrifice themselves for their children's benefit. That's a huge part of a traditional American approach to raising children. But one of the things I learned from my Chinese friends who understood Confucianism was that, no, it's more like a family of uh, big cats or dogs. Who eats first? The alpha. The alpha male, then the alpha female, then the others in hierarchy. The scraps are left for the lower class. So, if a child must suffer for a father's career, so be it. That's tradition. But in communism, it's not part of a balanced philosophy of social harmony, which, which is what Confucianism is. It's not part of a broader tradition the party is the vanguard of the revolution, and the individual must serve the party. History is not made, according to Marx, by individuals. The way I teach history is so anachronistic, because I have told you about Pheidippides, the first marathon runner, and Winston Churchill and his decision not to surrender Britain to the Nazis in the summer of 1940, and countless other individuals who have changed the world with their insistence on being themselves, on standing up for what they believe is true. To a Marxist, history is a matter of socioeconomic forces, broad socioeconomic forces. And every individual that retrograde historians like myself point to, they say, you're simply pointing to a, a, a poster child. The needs of the moment, the socioeconomic forces, inevitably raised somebody to be the figurehead. But the figurehead doesn't make it. The froth on the top of an oceanic wave is not what makes the wave. The wave makes the froth. The times make the man. It is socioeconomic classes wrangling with one another that really make history. Anything else is just the vanity of ego. So you will subsume yourself to the party's discipline, even if that means the most intimate violations, which the honey trap is. The woman who does it, no doubt there are a few men who do it today, but and, and back then, um, there is no privacy. I have long said, if you want to understand a totalitarian society, imagine a city without doors, windows, or curtains, or shades. Imagine a language without the word no. The party needs, you obey. That's it. Now, violent revolution is preferable, according to Marx, because of the dialectic. Because the more intense the conflict, the more uh, decisive the result. So, what is more decisive than the people rising up and seizing control of the means of production? What could possibly be more decisive than the trajectory of a bullet into a an enemy's skull. Everyone knows after that who won and who lost. The guy bleeding on the ground without a head, he, he lost. The guy with the smoking weapon, he won. So revolution, violence, war between the classes is not something to be avoided. It's not something to be mitigated. It's not something that we want to uh, evolve. No, no. Evolution, according to Marx, is nonsense. Except that it, at least evolution in terms of evolution towards communism. What you need is the clarity, the crystal clarity of revolution. People must take sides. People, it, it's a Manichaean struggle. Manny was a Zoroastrian um, prophet and philosopher who talked about the world of 
Ahura Mazda, the Lord of Light, and Araman, the Dark Lord. And this Persian Zoroastrian dualism, a Lord of Light, a Lord of Darkness, and the world will ultimately tilt towards one or the other. Well, this Manichaeanism, this sense that there is no gray in the middle, there is no middle ground. You either are with us or against us. This is very communist. It's very Marxist. And the dictatorship of the proletariat is the, um, the oppression that anyone who looks at the history of communism sees. It is a history of violent oppression because that needs to happen. Just like a person who breaks bones needs to have their limb immobilized in a cast, so, or you end up like Johnny Tremaine, which is a, a, a book that hopefully you've read um, about a young boy in the American Revolution, something that middle schoolers often read. Um, and in that book, he broke his arm and it didn't heal right and he ended up being lame for the rest of his life because, because of that. Um, just because, for the same reason, the dictatorship of the proletariat is the body cast of society after the revolution and before all the people who remember the time before the revolution die off. Any question on any of the principles we've talked about before we go into the variant isms of communism and its related ideologies in history? I see no questions. Please close the shades and shut the fan off. Now, I'm actually going to be covering some of these because, well, in a moment I'll be covering some of these. Go ahead and do that. First of all, there are some broad themes within socialism. And these broad themes are really tensions because different types of socialists fall differently on the various uh, tensions that I'm about to describe. So one of the most basic tensions within socialism is, is it international or national? International socialism has um, workers of the world, unite! You have nothing to lose but your chains. Workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. Marxian communism and much pure socialism is absolutely international in character. Because Marx de-emphasizes nationhood as nothing more than mere a savage vestige of tribalism. Irrelevant to the modern era. What matters is, are you a peasant, a proletarian, a bourgeois, or an aristocrat? Your social identity, your social class determines your identity. So, Lenin actually writes a book in the early 20th century before taking power. Uh, Imperialism, the last stage of capitalism. Where Lenin does what Marx didn't. Lenin says that the people of the world, the colonial world then, the third world today, the peoples of Latin America and Africa and Asia, who at that time were under European rule, are the proverbial proletariat of the world. And that it's not just about making the lives of German workers or Russian workers better. It's about making all humanity come under one system of justice and social uh, reform. So you've got international socialism, which is usually traditional communism. And then you've got national socialism. National Socialism combines the two most vibrant ideologies. We haven't talked much about nationalism yet. We soon will. Nationalism is the belief that everyone of a certain heritage shares a common destiny. We are of the blood and soil of our fatherland. This is true for Germans, Belgians, French, Italians, Spaniards. It's true of the English, it's true of the Norwegians, of the Swedes, it's true of the Poles, the Lithuanians, the Latvians, the Estonians, it's true of the Ukrainians, it's true of the Russians, it's true of the Jews. We are a people. We come from a unique heritage. We, as a people, have distinct language, customs, beliefs. We are unified in destiny by blood and soil, culture and tradition. 
It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, urban or rural, beautiful or ugly, male or female. It doesn't matter except that you know that you are with us. You are Franche Suisse, a French stock. You are a part of the Deutsche Volk, the German people. You are from Rodina, the motherland of Russia. Or any of the num number of other na nation nations, national cultures that exist within Europe. This idea of nationalism is something I'm going to explore in much greater detail. But Mussolini first does this in Italy. He takes Italian nationalism, which unifies Italy in the 1870s, and combines it with a variant of Roman history, and combines that with a desire to expand Italian power, and soon you have Mussolini's Italy. Communists love to make a big distinction between fascists and communists. In fact, most of the political uh, spectra that you're going to be taught in schools has liberal democracy in the middle, and from your perspective, communism on the left and fascism or national socialism on the right. No. <laughs> now, what part of National Socialist German Workers' Party is unclear to you? The functional scale of government, which I've shown you already, has anarchy on one side, the lack of government, and totalitarianism, whether it's communist or Nazi or fascist or whatever, on the other side of the spectrum. A government with no power, a government with total power. And in the middle, you've got liberal democracy, which, which is the uh, American system. Nationalism fused with socialism, is like an Africanized killer bee. Back in the 70s, there was a biological oops when some Africanized bees were brought to the Americas to try to stimulate honey production in certain, I believe it was Central American apiaries, which are places that grow, that, that produce honey. And the hybridized Africanized bees had a tendency to do something that rather surprised people. They had a tendency to swarm on a single target and kill it. Cattle? Bees killing cattle? Yep, it happens. Bees killing human beings? Yep, it happens. I remember in the late 70s, they used to track how close the Africanized killer bees were getting to our southern border. And there were even movies, horror movies, about the swarm of Africanized killer bees that would come in. Sometimes when you make a hybrid, an alloy, it's worse than either of its original things. Because an alloy is a synthesis. So you take nationalism and socialism, and you produce national socialism or Italian fascism, and you end up with something particularly nasty. Because you take the romantic ideas of the nation and you combine it with the rational hyper-intellectualism of communism, you end up with something that's in some ways stronger and more dangerous, certainly more aggressive. What Stalin does in Russia is more akin to national socialism than it is to pure communism. I mean, Stalin talks a good game ideologically, but when Stalin starts talking about socialism in one country, which is the Soviet Union, um, what he does is he takes more and more Russian characteristics and grafts them into communism, making Soviet communism uh, uh, also a variant of national socialism. And that's one of the reasons why they survive in World War II. In fact, during World War II, they slough off many of the communist traits, and they call this the Great Patriotic War. And that second um, national anthem I told you about, it wasn't the international, it was the Soviet anthem. There's references to Russia and great Russian traditions, and so on and so forth. Shh! I've got a big secret. The Chinese Communist Party calls itself the Chinese Communist Party. They have a hammer and sickle. It's a Chinese sickle. It's got a little ball instead of a little handle on the sickle. But it's still the hammer and sickle crossed, bright yellow on a blood-red field. 
But the economic system of the Chinese Communist Party since the 1970s has been the economic system of Hitler. Cartel capitalist. It's not communist at all. If you're a Chinese, you do not have a social service net. Chinese communism is an attempt to take the vibrancy of capitalism and keep it under the rule of the Communist Party. This is exactly what Hitler does. You encourage the growth of business, of corporations. You let people make money so long as they don't do anything to violate your political control. That's the way it worked. So is there anywhere in the world that is purely communist? Well, North Korea, arguably. But even North Korea takes on national uh, traits. But in any case, generally, com communism pretends to be international and fascism tends to be national socialism. Here's another trait, uh, 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 blah, 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 line of tension. The Marxists and communists and even the Nazis and um, uh, fascists tend to be revolutionary socialists. Because they believe in some variant of the dialectic, they believe that conflict is good. But you know what? Evolutionary socialists have been far more successful in the long run. Let me explain. In Europe, you've got the British Labour Party, the German Social Democratic Party. You've got socialist parties throughout Europe, not communist, socialist. And these social democratic parties have worked within liberal democratic constitutions and republics. People say, ah, Sweden and Denmark and Norway uh, and, and even Finland, they, they're, all, they're all socialist. No, they're not. They're liberal democratic. They've got companies, they've got industries that are not under government control, but they tend to be run by social democrats. Social democrats in Western Europe tend to slowly build a more socialistic society by developing a womb-to-the-tomb, cradle-to-grave welfare state. When you are born in France, the government is there to help keep you alive as an infant, to help you grow up right and strong in schools and with physical education. And the government is there to make sure that your education leads to a particular set of job opportunities. The government is there to make sure that if you don't get a job for a while, you'll have at least a minimum basic income, that your health care will be taken care of. The government is there when you're in your old age to take care of you, give you medical care until you die. <clears throat> But it's not pure socialism at all, because in France there are other parties. The socialists don't always win elections. And the socialists, while they have changed France's economy from a capitalist one to a mixed economy, to a welfare state, it still has to deal with elections, it has, still has to deal with issues of free speech and so forth. So when you look at Scandinavia, they do the same thing. You cannot say... <clears throat> reasonably, that Sweden shows that socialism works. It doesn't. Sweden, show, Sweden shows that liberal democracy works even when you have social democratic parties that predominate. predominate. American progressives, you want to talk about success story. The notion of a society that has the federal government of the United States involved in your health care choices. The notion of a society that has the federal government provide social security in your old age. The notion that the federal government of the United States would be involved in labor policy, would be involved in workplace safety policy, would be involved in food safety issues. The notion that the federal government of the United States would have anything to do with education would have been anathema 120 years ago to almost every American, except the most committed progressives. Those issues were for the states and people respectively. The Constitution makes it very clear what the job of the federal government is. And the federal government's constitutional job includes none of those things. It includes national defense. It includes the regulation of interstate trade, foreign policy. Most domestic policy issues are for the states. But now, 120 years later, we live in a society where everything I just said is true. The federal government has taken an interest 
and has made regulations and has shaped policy in healthcare, in education, in labor relations, in food and workplace safety regulations, in environmental regulations. The federal government does Social Security, Medicaid, Medicare, Obamacare. And to most Americans, this is normal. Why? Because it's evolutionary change. There's the old adage. If you drop a frog into boiling water, which is a lousy thing to do, don't do that. Don't be a sadistic jerk. But if you drop a frog in boiling water, it will immediately jump out as soon as it can. Because it hurts. However... If you're an evil, even more evil, lousy, rotten, waste of space person, you put the frog in some comfortable water, give them something to eat, they'll relax, and then you slowly turn up the temperature. And only after it's too late, after their skin has begun to bubble and their organs have begun to cook, will they realize, oh my God, I'm boiling. They'll say this in frog, of course, and, and then it's too late because they won't be able to get out because their muscles will already be enervated. Um, you can boil a frog to death just by turning up the temperature slowly. When I was um, young, by the way, we may have to do the quiz one day. Woo! Don't cheer yet. I haven't made my decision yet, Velasco. Um, and besides, your happiness makes me want to just hold it now. Um, do it. Just kidding, don't do it. Got him right over there. Please don't. Okay. When I was a kid, you could smoke anywhere. Around the time I was born, they made the first rule. Can't smoke in an elevator. That makes sense. Elevator, closed in space, not much air. You get a pregnant woman in there. The nicotine smoke might bother the baby. Uh, somebody has asthma. Okay, that's reasonable. It's closed in space. It's only temporary. You can smoke before the elevator ride, after the elevator ride, but not in an elevator. And look at what has changed. We now have people who actually argue, you can't smoke here. I'm outside. It's a park. Yeah, it's a public park, and we've got no smoking rules. No smoking in the public park. Outside. You've got a campfire. Yeah, but that's not tobacco! It's not nicotine! I'm vaping! The only thing I'm breathing out is water vapor! It's so not nicotine! No smoking! We've gotten to a point. We've gotten to a point where smoking has been taken out of movie theaters. It's been taken out of taxi cabs and buses. It's been taken out when I was a high school student, when I was a freshman, please wait. We had a smoking lounge for teachers. And we had a smoking lounge for students. <laughs> because if you were a senior in high school or if you turned 18, you could legally smoke. Legally smoke? Why not? Um, teachers used to smoke while lecturing. Sometimes they'd smoke a pipe. And that would make them look more sophisticated. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but, yeah, the people would smoke all the time. They'd smoke while working. They'd smoke during meetings. They'd smoke while flying. They'd smoke while on a train. Now we are to a point where you not only have to go outside if you smoke in the workplace, but I've seen this in Portland. They had an insurance company that had a huge parking lot, and right in the middle of the parking lot, about 40 yards away from the building, they had this little blue circle, and that was the smoking area. So it wasn't just that you could go outside and stand by the door. No, you had to walk through the weather to this little circle of shame where everyone can see you from inside and you're, you know, puffing away. Now, I know a bunch of you are going to talk about lung cancer and emphysema and all the other health problems of smoking. That's not the point. I smoked for 23 years and I smoked camels. Camels are Turkish blend cigarettes without filters. Okay, when I smoked, I really smoked. Um... I stopped because I started coughing blood. And when you do that, that's sort of a hint, gentle hint, the body's telling you, stop smoking. So I stopped. Please wait. It'll be a while. 
I'm not saying smoking's healthy. Obviously, I don't smoke anymore. I haven't smoked for a long time. But you know what's less healthy? Propaganda. Propaganda is less healthy. And the propaganda campaigns against smoking have included, hey, it's a children's show. Let's show you the extracted lungs of a dead smoker. <laughs> this is what your lungs become with nicotine. And ah! Because you're showing little children. Look, if you show little children healthy lungs, they're not going to go, oh, they're so pink and lovely. No, they're going to go, ah! Because they're lungs. If you're seeing lungs, something has gone badly wrong. Unless you're a doctor, and most kids aren't doctors, except Doogie Hauser, MD. It's a ter terrible TV show. <laughs> no, you're not supposed to see lungs. So that's a bad thing. Anyway, we're to the point now where people in some federal housing projects, in homes that they rent and get as benefits from the government, <laughs> aren't allowed to smoke in their homes. Oh, propaganda. Oh, evolutionary change. American progressives have been incredibly successful because they're not revolutionary. Well, until, you know, AOC and recently, and they're going to they're going to probably fail because the American people are reflexively anti-socialist. But if you boil us to death slowly, generation by generation, work at things, by the time you're my age, will you still be allowed to eat a cheeseburger? Will you still be allowed to eat beef? Will you still be allowed to have doorknobs that aren't those slab European things? I mean, real round doorknobs? Will you be allowed to keep an air conditioner in your home or a heater in your home? Or, or, or will it be like in, in Moscow during Soviet days where the government controls your thermostat? That's really what happened. They had steam tunnels under Moscow for everyone, and you got heat maybe two or three hours a day. And they didn't tell you when the heat was coming. It'll be a while. Maybe hot water, too. The government disperses. The party disperses. So evolutionary socialism in Europe and the United States isn't considered real communism by the Marxists or the fascists or the Nazis. <laughs> But it's worked pretty well. We live in a transformed society. Yes, and then yes. Okay, so one about the frog thing. Yeah. So my dad, when he was a kid, used to take like ants and worms. I don't want to hear this, Haley. I don't. It's the sign of a <laughs> budding serial killer. Anyone who grows up torturing animals, not a good sign. Anyway, go on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> say that. Some alien. Ah, it's a human. It's a human. It's not a tetrisi. Go. <laughs> and then um, about the regulating like heat. Yeah, yeah. In Colorado, you can't have certain um, like water things. Yeah, it doesn't that, matter. You can smoke as much, much pot water. as you want. People won't care what the government does yeah, like, because no, idiots. like you, like the, your water, like for showers and stuff, you yep. can't have certain kinds that give you too much water. You have to like import them from other states. So, like my yeah. uncle, he, yeah. he ordered one to my nana's and she shipped it, but you can't buy them in Colorado. No, you can't because the government has an interest in how much. Water you use. So uh, look, we used to have uh, real toilets, but before you guys were born, the federal government, you're after him, uh, gets involved in, in requiring that we have low flow toilets. About 10 years ago, we had real incandescent light bulbs. Uh, and then the government got involved and said, oh, no, you can't have incandescent light bulbs easily available. So everyone went, went over to LEDs or, or some other, uh, you know, uh, chlor little fluorescent bulbs. It's bad. Uh, the federal government of the United States, which has no constitutional role. Everything's involved with interstate trade, and that's the excuse they use. But yeah, yeah, yes. When I was still in San Diego, we go to the commissary. So when you go on, yeah, you go on base, and you get to the commissary, and there's this walled off section off to the side for smokers, like specifically like walled off, or like seven feet high, and there's no benches or anything in there. It's just a gravel pit. Oh, and that's where you smoke? Yep. Yeah. Yeah, they're trying to nudge you out of smoking. Look, I used to be able to go to the store and get cigarettes for my grandpa when I was six or seven <laughs> or eight. Why? Because everyone knew. I, he'd let me get a box of uh, of candy cigarettes. They don't have those anymore either. Because he would have his cigarette and I'd have my candy cigarette. It was cool. We were both cool. <laughs> this is cool to smoke. Yeah.
Yes. Okay, so so Europe on whole has like a huge smoking problem. So like anywhere you, you call go, it a problem, but, well, no <laughs> but like well, like the government's like I I guess seen as such a huge problem where we um we go into like a supermarket in like Germany or in the Czech Republic, and on each box is a really like gruesome, terrible photo of like someone's lung or someone who is like amputated or even the. Uh, the most shocking thing that me and my sister saw, we were on a bus in Prague, and these huge billboards, I'm not even joking when I say they were, like, as tall as that wall to that wall, yep. and, like, maybe twice the ceiling would hide, and they were, like, these nude men that had, like, problems from smoking. People saw every day, and it was, like, to really, like, drill in your mind, like, don't do this, but they... Yeah. See, that, <laughs> what it gets you used to, aside from ugly male bodies being displayed in front of the city, is... No, um, like, all next to each oh. other. Yeah, no. The government is telling you, ooh, this is good, this is bad. If they had the guts, they'd make it outlawed. But they know that what would happen is the same thing that happened when they made alcohol illegal in the United States in the 1920s. People would go to criminals. So instead, they play these games. You know whose business it is if I smoke? Mine. No one else's. Because I'm a free man. My business. But we can't get secondhand smoke. We used to live in cities that had coal fires everywhere. Everywhere. The British have a song in World War II, keep the home fires burning. Every house had a coal stove with an unfiltered chimney. In your living room. Keep the home fires burning. <laughs> you know, people, London fog. <laughs> London fog was coal smoke, and it was deadly. People lived through over 100 years of that. Don't tell me that secondhand smoke is going to be a problem when I'm smoking in an outdoor park. It is none of anyone's business. But look, in the name of public health, what people are willing to do. Not to mention the social science experiment of the Wuhan flu over the last year and a half, two years. Two years, it'll be two years in March. Two years since we started changing our lives for basically an extreme version of the flu. Yep, all in the name of public health. So, evolutionary socialism works. Did he just say? Yep. <laughs> but what's the other side? Well, the other side is if you wear a mask and get vaccinated, you won't get the disease. <laughs> now, the figures don't back that up, but it's the way we want it to be. Just be be good. What? So, uh, my mom's uh, work, she, that, like, everybody except for her and, like, one more person is vaccinated, right? Yeah. One person, plus two people who weren't vaccinated, were not out sick. Everybody else who was vaccinated was out sick with COVID. <laughs> mm -hmm. <sighs> I and the doctor's think, like, I'm starting to rethink all this, and my mom's like, It's about time. <laughs> there is no magic bullet. It's just life. It, you know, when you do germ warfare experiments and they get out, bad things happen. That's oh, and they denied that for the first year or so too. It's a lab leak theory. It's a conspiracy. No, 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 most people know where it's from. Okay, so revolutionary versus evolutionary, both can work. Evolutionary is surprisingly effective. Ideological versus pragmatic. Ideological socialism says the theory, the theory, the theory, the theory. Pragmatic socialism says whatever works. So, communists tend to be very theoretical. Marx says this, we've got to do things this way. European Social Democrats, British Labour Party, for example, no, the hell with theory. I want, I want coal miners to get a better deal. I want uh, air, train workers to get a better deal. I, I, I want uh, a minimum wage. I, I want a minimum basic income. It, for, for some socialists, it is about the living standard issues. For other socialists, it's about the dream of a utopia. So ideological versus pragmatic. Now, you've also got chaotic anarchic versus lawful or hierarchical. Anarcho-syndicalism is inspired by socialism. Anarcho-syndicalism was big in Spain in the 1930s during their civil war. Imagine a valley with a village in it. A bunch of Basque peasants or Aragonese peasants, Catalan peasants. And they uh, decide that the land is now ours. 
And they're going to come together in committee and decide how the fields are going to be planted, how they're going to be worked, how they're going to be harvested. People stop cooking in their homes. They start eating in common cafeterias. It's more efficient. Everyone eats together, builds social unity. Children are no longer raised by mom and dad. Mom and dad can visit, they can bring the kids home, but children are spend most of their time with other children and with, with, with teachers who are going to raise them right. right. Um, everyone shares the work. So everyone works in the field, cleans the lavatories. Everyone uh, helps teach the kids. Everyone does some entertaining. Everyone does some planning. Everything is shared. Now, it's a local form of socialism. And oddly enough, during the times when it was tried, it came closest to actually being a form of socialism that worked. Now, there were two reasons for this. How could anarcho-syndicalist communes work? And this is me, an anti-communist, telling you it worked. First of all, they were small. They were small-scale enough so that everyone knew everyone. It was a village. We were all, we've already, we've been here for generations. Our families go back. So there's a sense of mutual trust and mutual identity. We are a group. The other thing is it was voluntary. If you didn't like it, you could leave. Now, the other form of socialism that actually works happens in Israel. It's called a kibbutz, K-I-B-B-U-T-Z. An Israeli kibbutz is a common farm. Now, kibbutzim are run in the same way I just told you about those anarchist syndicalist communes. There are committees for everything, People eat together, the children are raised together, uh, the parents certainly are involved in their kids' lives, but, lives, but they don't rule them. Uh, everyone does every kind of work. They, they, they rotate, they share leadership, they share the, the grungiest work in the community. And kibbutzim can work. They work for three reasons. And kibbutzim have been around in Israel since before Israel was Israel. There were kibbutzes during the late um, Ottoman period and during the period after World War I. They work because they're small scale. Again, everyone knows everyone. You can negotiate with people. You can talk to people. The second reason is you don't have to stay. You can leave. So nobody is forced to live in the kibbutz who doesn't want to live in the kibbutz except kids. And, you know, you're in any society, kids are stuck in the situations they're stuck until they get old enough. The third reason is that kibbutzim are supported as charitable donations by other Israelis and by Jews outside of Israel who believe in socialism. These subsidies provided by wealthy donors make it also possible for kibbutzim to survive even into the present day. So I'm not saying socialism has, socialism, not communism, socialism has never worked. Socialism can work if it's small scale and voluntary, and it's nice to get help from the outside. But it can work under those conditions. But when you make it a national or a, a, a state that is mandatory, that's where the coercion comes in. So a lot of the people who are effective socialists are chaotic or anarchic. In other words, they don't see the need for a central government. They see a need for holding things in common, for having committees about everything. Whereas the lawful or hierarchical variants of socialism are definitely, well, there's a quote up here on the wall that's about how things are done in communist China. I may or may not have read it to you before, but I'm going to read it to you now. Okay. They hold big meetings to decide small issues. Small meetings to decide big issues. And for the most, most important issues, they hold no meetings at all. So imagine you've got school, a school, and they'll have a school-wide meeting. What's our mascot going to be? Are we going to be the capybaras? Are we going to be the badgers? Are we going to be the Indians? No! Uh, what, 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 what's our mascot going to be? And that's everyone in the school. Then, are we going to stiffen our graduation requirements? Well, that's a small meeting of the principal, the vice principal, the guidance counselor, and maybe the chairman of the various departments. 
chairman of history, chairman of English, chairman of math, whatever. That's a small meeting deciding a pretty big issue, graduation requirements. The principal himself, though, maybe with the superintendent's advice, maybe with the assistant principal's advice, the principal himself, though, will decide uh, whether a kid is going to get expelled or other big issues. So we hold big meetings for small issues, small meetings for big issues, and for the most important issues, there are no meetings at all. In a hierarchical socialism, you cannot have popular sovereignty. In other words, real hardcore Marxists don't believe in democracy. They don't believe in committees. They don't believe in votes. They don't believe in the anarcho-syndicalism or the, or, or the kibbutzim. They, what they believe is that the party knows best and the leadership knows best and the leader knows best. Do you see the difference there? Their form of communism is top-down. It's Hobbesian. It's Leviathan-like. You've been at it a lot, so... Okay. So, um, these are the various tensions within socialism. Now we're going to start talking variants. Actually, we're almost done. So, tomorrow what we're going to do is variants. Variant socialisms, and I will talk about them in different nations. And uh, because I don't want you to test on the same day that we do something, this quiz, which is extensive on socialism, will be done on Monday along with your next chapter survey, which is chapter survey 22, which is due Monday, and there will also, of course, be a Baker quiz on that. Questions, comments, thoughts? Okay, and we're done.